Well, Martin, here we go again. Sunny Australia, the skies are blue, a new season. I can hardly wait. How do you feel about it? Well, I'm really looking forward to it, hoping uh, we can work well together and give the viewers some good commentating to go with a good Grand Prix yeah, season. Yeah, so do I, but uh, watch it here. Remember what happened last year? What are you talking about? This is Turn 3 Melbourne. They don't come any easier than this. Martin, just remember! Coming up to Turn 3, lap 1 is Villeneuve in the lead, then the two Ferraris, Damon Hill is fourth, and then there's a coming together, and it's one of the Jordans, straight across and into the Armco, and this looks a very, very nasty one indeed. It, it's Martin Brundle's car, but Villeneuve is still leading, the race is still on, and miracle of miracles, Martin Brundle looks to be perfectly all right. This is virtually unbelievable. Ah, here's the replay. Now, look for the Jordan. There it is. He's hit Coulthard's McLaren, gone over Johnny Herbert's car, and seemingly is all right. This is amazing. Well, Martin, thankfully, you're not going to have that problem this year. You're going to be nice and safe in the commentary box with me. Yeah, I was never any good at parking, actually, <laughs> but... Uh... Yeah, I mean, what actually happens, Murray? Do you kick me when I've got to say something? <laughs> or what? I mean, I mean, what are we going to do? Well, we'll see, but there's a big night coming up for Grand Prix fans. Really? Because we've got the Clive James Grand Prix special, oh, yeah. then into Grand Prix the movie, and then it's the Australian Grand Prix live on ITV, you and I! <laughs> The the, uh, the movie. You you were the commentator in that too, were you? I thought you were driving in it. No, my granddad told me about it. <laughs> Grand Prix Racing, the fastest, most glamorous sport on the globe. Tonight, Clive James meets the man behind the helmets, the greatest number of Grand Prix drivers ever assembled at a studio, including world champion Damon Hill, Jack Villeneuve, David Coulthard, Mika Hakkinen, Heinz Harold Frensen, plus two ex-world champions, Jackie Stewart and Nigel Mansell, and the man who's been called the greatest British driver of all time, Sterling Moss. They're all here in the Clive James Formula One show. Only a few hours from now, this screen will go live to Melbourne and transmit the earth-shattering start of the opening race in the first Formula One season to be covered by ITV. It's a good time to look at the chequered flag history and the mega-budget, multi-time zone present status of this globe-girdling extravaganza. For this unprecedented program, celebrities in other fields are here because they're mad about Formula One, and key figures of Formula One, who usually gather only at the racetrack, wherever it is in the world, are here too. As we scan their intelligent faces, we can tell these people are highly qualified. <laughs> Scanning my face, you can guess that my only qualification for being here is that I'm mad about the racing cars. I can't even drive an ordinary car in a way acceptable to the general public or the police, but the Formula One drivers do my driving for me. They also do my bravery, skill and youth. In the fastest cars anyone can afford to build, they fight it out to a finish while I watch. That's what Formula One is, a dream come true. The cars are boys' toys in a big way, million-dollar micro-models that you can actually get into before you run them into each other and your mother can't make you stop. For the spectators who wish they were doing it, but are secretly glad they aren't allowed to, the first impression of a Formula One race is of a blur that screams, bumper cars gone bananas, a bobsleigh battle with asphalt for ice. It takes time to sort out that these hurtling machines have drivers inside them who don't want to stop doing this, but want to go on doing it, no matter what happens, and a lot can. A car that cost a fortune can convert itself to scrap iron in a split second. While the bit the driver sits in is so strong nowadays that he's hard to hurt, the rest of the car is all too eager to spread itself around the landscape. But it isn't enough for the driver to keep his car and himself in one piece. He has to do that going faster than anyone else. If he can, he emerges at the end of the season as world champion. He came late to Formula One, but in only four seasons, he has lived the complete experience from nowhere to the pinnacle. Will you welcome the reigning world champion, Damon Hill. Well, it's 
been quite a year, hasn't it? It's a bit of an understatement, I think, Clive. <laughs> it's uh, certainly been uh, a year that uh, had everything packed into it, yeah. And you snatched victory from the jaws of almost not victory. But it's, uh, it's like that all the way through a season, you know, there's, there's always plenty of opportunity to let it slip. And, uh, mm. uh, but the tension made it all more worthwhile, I think, when it came off. Well, that's end. what I was most impressed by, the way you held up under pressure, I'm bound to say. Well, you can't answer that, that's a compliment. <laughs> okay, I won't answer that, I'll accept it. <laughs> how has it affected your life, being champion? Um, I've, I've sort of learned how to receive awards, I think, is uh, one of the things I've been doing a lot. And uh, I've, um, I've been absolutely spoiled everywhere I've gone, and people have been fantastic to me, and uh, it's been absolutely amazing. Last year, Williams not renewing your contract was very public. Did you feel bitter about that at times? I don't think I really had time to feel any bitterness. I uh, was in the middle of trying to win the championship, so I kind of pressed on regardless and uh, put it behind me. Well, Patrick Head is one of the team bosses at Williams. Is actually here tonight. Now's your chance to, to have a word with him. <laughs> Pat, would you like to say something to Patrick? Hello, Patrick. <laughs> Miss me? <laughs> Patrick Head, have you got anything to say to David? Uh, no, I just wish him all the best for 1997. <laughs> Hello, Dem. <laughs> Good to see you. Uh, I, think, I think the warmth oh, no. is so touching. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> How's it been working with Tom Walkinshaw and, and the Arrows team? It's been, it's been very good so far. We're hard pushed, uh, working very, very hard to get things ready and uh, they're very professional and doing a great job at the moment. Well, if I said, did you, do you seriously think you can win again? That would be an insult to the team. But do you think you can win again? Well, I have no doubt that I can win again. It's uh, just a matter of when. And uh, that's, that's the unknown factor at the moment. And how long are you going to give it? How long have you got? <laughs> as long as it takes, I think. Well, Damon, development driving is one of the things you do brilliantly well, so Arrows is lucky to have you, so good luck with the season. Thank you very much. <laughs> but Damon won't be the only driver on the track in 1997. Let's meet some of the others. Driving for Williams, Jacques Villeneuve from Canada. Last season was his first season in Formula One and he almost pipped Damon for the championship. Driving the other Williams, Heinz Harold Frenzen from Germany. Ein cool customer taking over Damon's hot seat. Driving for McLaren, David Coulthard from Scotland. Very quick in the car and very charming out of it, helped by that square-jawed, radiant smile. <laughs> Driving the other McLaren, floppy-haired Mika Hakkinen from Finland. Hurt badly in Adelaide at the end of the season before last, but he's come all the way back. Driving for Sauber, Johnny Herbert from Britain. He's won Grand Prix races before, but has his car got as much fizz, verve and grit as he has? Driving the other Sauber, Nicola Larini from Italy. A talented driver long in search of a car that will go. Copes well with being called Nicola. Pedro Diniz is Damon Hill's teammate at Arrows. He comes from one of Brazil's wealthiest families and he's doing an increasingly good job of living down his image as a rich boy who can buy a ride. Driving for Tyrrell, Jos Verstappen from Holland. A country previously famous for Rembrandt, Vermeer and Van Gogh, none of whom could drive a racing car. Driving for Minardi, Ukio Katayama from Japan. Sometimes performs so brilliantly during the race that he is allowed to leave early. To thousands of Japanese would-be drivers, Kata is their Damon Hill. Vincenzo Sospiri was a star in kart racing and Formula 3000. Now he's in Formula 1, driving a brand new Lola that might need everything he's got. Driving for Jordan, Giancarlo Fisichella. He's been working on his English all winter, and he can already say, Madam, what you are proposing is physically impossible in my overalls. <laughs> Driving for Stewart, Rubens Barrichello from Brazil, where the fans loudly expect him to be the next Ayrton Senna, and he could do it if he had a fast car. Will the new Stewart be it? Driving the other Stewart, Jan Magnussen from Denmark. No relation to Magnus Magnussen except for his motto, I've started, so I'll finish. Okay, Jacques Villeneuve, your tip for world champion this year, what's going to stop you? Well, there's a lot of people that are going to try, uh, Heinz to start with, and Michael with Ferrari, then both uh, David and Mika with the McLaren, the two Benetton drivers, and all the other guys. Everybody's going out there to, to try and get the best result, and uh, they're going to get closer this year than they were last year, so the competition should be good. We, our car last year was very, very good, and it's going to be difficult to improve it. 
Everybody in Formula One says that the Williams could win with your grandmother driving it, so where does that leave the driver? Well, in the back seat. <laughs> <laughs> Last year, you were Damon's problem, and this year, Heinz Harold could be yours. Are you bothered by that? No, I hope, I hope he's going to be a bother, because uh, racing without competition would be boring. Heinz Harold, uh, you're in Damon's seat at Williams, and a lot of people think that he should never have lost it. That makes you the bad guy. Are you coping with this? Well, first I have to say I'm very delighted to drive for Williams. And uh, another thing I have to say that Damon has done uh, a very good job in the past years. And uh, winning the world title, world championship last year, was evident enough. Are you two speaking, but by the way? Damon and Heinz Harold? He didn't answer yes. the question, did he? <laughs> we have another guy. <laughs> no, it's finish. No, it's... Uh, um, I don't know, it's, um, it could be that uh, the people are throwing with tomatoes at me <laughs> <laughs> here in England, but um, anyway, I have to say that um, um, Damon has done a good job. That's all I can say. Vincenzo Zaspiri, you've been world karting champion and Formula 3000 champion, but now you're finally in Formula One. You're in a car that's how shall I put this? It's like, not likely to be a front runner. Uh, is it better to be on top of the heap in the lower formulas or bottom of the pile in Formula One? Well, I think it's always better to win and to be at the top, but uh, I think you have to work your way to get there, as Damon did with Brabham when he was in, went into Formula One and then now he's world champion. I hope to do the same thing. We started with a new team, Master Carlo Ola Formula One. We have a four-year program, so I think uh, in four years, we would do a good job to get there. David, last year the McLaren really wasn't up there. Um, how do you cope knowing that you aren't going to win? <laughs> <laughs> I thought long and hard about these questions. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um... <laughs> oh, actually, believe it or not, every time I took to the circuit, I thought I was going to win, and it always came as a great surprise at the end of Sunday afternoon that I hadn't. <laughs> Um, but, no, you, you start the race believing that you're going to, to give it your best shot and, you know, you can win races even if you're not in the front row because other cars drop out and, you know, shit happens. And Mika Hacken, and Mika, it's your fifth year at McLaren. Is this the year for you and the team? Well, I thought my year's going to be already 93 and it still really hasn't happened, but I, I believe uh, and testing what we have done so far has been uh, quite encouraging, so I believe this year is going to be a good year. So I hope that means we're going to win some races. Johnny, you couldn't even walk when you started driving in Formula One because your legs have been smashed up in Formula 3000. Why did you go on? Um, I think it was just basically that I had that enthusiasm to get back into racing and I knew that if I tried hard enough and tried my, my best to get the fitness back and getting the mobility back in the feet, that I could give it another go. If I failed at that, at least I, inside I knew I gave, gave it my best shot of actually getting back into, into racing in Formula One. Ukyo Karayama. Hajime mashite Karayama-san. Ah, Yurashiku. Ukyo, in your first Formula One season you had three shunts. In your second you had four. In your third, six. And in your fourth, seven. <laughs> what are your plans for this season? I mean, I didn't know, so you were counting. Counting the number of my shots. Uh, so, uh, don't try to upset Giancarlo Minari. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, of course, I try to finish all races. <laughs> Just for Stappen, you've got a reputation for being very fast, but also a uh, trifle hair-raising. Now you've got a good driver, Tyrrell. Are you planning to calm down your act a bit? Um, certainly. We had, we had a lot of problems um, during the years I'm in Formula One. I uh, had a few crashes, that, that's right. But it was not always my fault. Um, <laughs> but I must say, uh, for sure, I'm, I'm trying to finish all the races, what I can. But it, uh, I try it many times, but uh, sometimes you, uh, you go off and it's not your fault. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> well, your team boss, Ken Tyrrell, is in the audience. Ken Tyrrell, what are you going to do to calm your boy down? We had Jost at Silverstone today on a wet track and we didn't need to calm him down. I thought every lap he went out on looked like a qualifying lap. And uh, he looks good to me. That's inspiring leadership, Ken. Thank you very much. <laughs> Jan Magnussen, when you drove in Formula 3, 
you were seen as being a Formula One champion of the future, but now you're actually in Formula One, you're, you're chiefly famous for not caring very much about fitness and being a heavy smoker. <laughs> now, Jackie Stewart has announced he's going to put you on the straight and narrow. Do you think he'll be able to reform you? I'm sure he's going to try. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> as you know, Jackie Stewart is here tonight. He's sitting in the audience. Jackie, are you going to impose your will on this boy? To say the very least, uh, uh, I don't think it's going to take much will. I, in fact, if it gets really difficult, I'll give them to Paul. Uh, that's what delegation is. Right. So you just tear the cigarettes from his hand, is that it? Yeah. No, I think he's going to want to do it, Clive. I think he's hungry. I think he knows this is a big opportunity for him. He's going to need his fitness, and he's going to have to breathe at the same time. Well, if people are hungry, they smoke, Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> Pedro Diniz, oh, you come from a wealthy background. Your family owns the Brazilian equivalent of Sainsbury's. Is being rich a help when you're trying to break into Formula One? When you are in the car driving, it doesn't matter if you have money or if your family has money. Uh, you need to drive and you need to drive by yourself, it doesn't matter really. Giancarlo Fisichella, last year you got bounced from the Minardi team because they ran out of money and they needed a driver with some of his own. How hard is it to keep going in Formula One without cash behind you? It's nearly impossible. You need money or you need uh, luck. I was lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Rubens Barrichello, you're a Brazilian and the nation's eye is on you to carry the mantle of Ayrton Senna. Do you feel the pressure of that? Well, it's been very difficult to begin with. 94, 95 was uh, very, very difficult. But I think, I think I've coped quite well with that pressure. And, uh, you know, beginning a new career with uh, the Stuart Ford team, it's, uh, it's a new life for me. When I go to a Grand Prix, I can't help noticing the one thing that never changes. The paddock is still full of pretty women. Uh, Giancarlo, the female readers of F1 Racing Magazine elected you as number one on their list of the top ten sexiest drivers. Now, do you find the abundance of female attention distracting? No, I have a girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> so... When I am in, uh, at races, uh, I'm, I just concentrate, concentrate to my, on my job. Oh. <laughs> Johnny. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Johnny, this list of the top ten sexiest drivers, you aren't even on it. What went wrong? <laughs> I think you're sexy. Oh, which magazine was it? This is F1. You the want a F1 copy? Magazine? I've got it here. No, no, no. Oh, it's, fair, it's hardly any sold of that magazine. Um, it's a shame for me. <laughs> um, again, I don't notice these sort of things because I'm dedicated to my job. I, I'm a, I've been a TV viewer and fan of Formula One for a long time, and I've watched it evolve. And I think with Ayrton Senna, this is a big, deep question that goes to the heart of the sport for me. With Ayrton Senna, he was a great driver, but he brought in the attitude that sportsmanship meant nothing and you should do anything the rules allow in order to win, up to and including pushing the other guy off the track. Now, was he right, Jacques? Well, I'm not sure he started that, um, but no, I don't think it's right when you race like that. Uh, you're still human beings in there and uh, there's right and wrong. And I, I believe the respect is the most important thing and a lot of times people ask you, do you hate the other opponents? Opponents, do you have to hate them to, to race well? And I think the best racing is in between friends when you know there's a huge amount of uh, respect. Well, uh, Damon, at the end of Japan, at the end of the last season, uh, all you had to do was crash into Jacques and take them both out of the race, and the championship would have been yours. Did you, ever, did you consider it? Well, yeah, that was my plan initially, was to crash into <laughs> I uh, didn't give he, him the chance. But he made I such a poor start, I couldn't see him. <laughs> So the thought never really crossed your mind? Huh? Only for about three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, I'm going to uh, thank you at that point, but stick around because there's a lot more to do and a lot more to say about Formula One. Thank you very much, the drivers.
More from the drivers later. But in part two, we look at the history of Formula One with world champions Jackie Stewart and Nigel Mansell and the great Sterling Moss. Fascinated with Grand Prix racing back in the 1950s, it looked very different. The cars looked less like spaceships and more like something you might drive. And the drivers sat up where you could see them, in helmets barely more than hard hats, so that you could see their faces. They were the faces of my heroes. One of them is still consistently voted one of the greatest drivers of all time, certainly the greatest driver never to be world champion. Even today, when there have been several British world champions, his is the name the public always invokes on the road when they shout, who do you think you are? Sterling Moss. Beautiful. There it is, the Maserati 250F, and it doesn't look like the cars of today. It looks beautiful. beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Beautiful. What's the layout? Well, the layout is the engine's up there to start with, in the front. It's got an ordinary sort of gearbox, a manual change, four or five speeds. This one's got five. It's then got an enormous fuel tank at the back here, about, uh, about 40 gallons, and then we put extra fuel in there, so it's a bit like a tanker when you finished. And uh, the tyres, as you notice, that's the biggest difference. I guess the normal tyres would be out here. And these were the best they could do and work quite well. How fast it. would it go? About 165, I suppose, 160. Depends who you're selling it to. <laughs> and what about through a corner? <laughs> well, around a corner, uh, take Stowe, which is a uh, corner at Silvers at the end of the straight. It's a very big sort of right angle. You go into that about 155, end, you know, coming down. Then you break down, change down a cog or two, and you probably do 108, 190 for Fangio. I've seen uh, photos of you doing that, and the car's sideways. Well, half sideways is what we call four-wheel drift, and that's when all four wheels are pointing the same way, and the car's actually actually is turning, and you're balancing it on the throttle. That was the beauty of this beautiful car. Is design. that because these narrow wheels had much less adhesion? Yeah, partly that, and, and the balance of the car was set up that way. And there's nothing squeezing the car down. It's the just... only thing holding this down is the weight, which, of course, when you go faster, it lessens. It looks kind of, shall we say, fragile? Um, yes, yes, you could say that. <laughs> it's lightweight tube, um, and, yeah, it was fragile. What happened if it hit something? It broke. I mean, it crumbled up a bit. <laughs> It depends how hard you hit it, but we didn't wear seat belts, no roll bars, mainly because if you had a crash, 50-50 chance you're going to catch fire, so we want to get out. Yeah, I get the point. Yeah. Mm. What was the sportsmanship like in that Tremendous. time? Tremendous. Tremendous. I mean, we were real friends. I remember going to race in, in Australia, and Sir so Jack Brabham, I broke my car in practice, the back axle, and he came along and gave me a spare, which enabled me to beat him, which I thought was rather nice. But if he hadn't done it, the others would have done it. You know, that's, yeah. that's the way it was. It was a great sport. And there was much less money in it in those days. Huh? Yeah, quite a lot less money. In, in 1961, I was the highest paid Formula One driver. I did 57 races and my total gross was 32,000. I paid tax on 8,000, which was good money. I mean, not by today's standards, but it was good money for me. Yeah. And there was no advertising on the car, no endorsements, no, no sponsorship? No, no advertising at all. The only advert, if you like, that I ever carried in my life was a small thing said Dunlop. And I did that because they gave me free overalls. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> Sterling, your stories touch me. Will you stay with us? We have a lot more to say about the yeah. sport as we go on. Thank you very much, Sterling Moss. <laughs> Sixteen years of relentless technical development later, the drivers were harder to see inside their helmets, but from inside one helmet came the unmistakably confident Scottish accent of a man who could make a bad car look good and take a good car first to the finish line in a full 27 of all the 99 Grand Prix races he ever entered. Today, on the verge of launching his own racing team, his name looms as large as ever, Jackie Stewart. <laughs> Jackie, this thing must look familiar. Yes, uh, in fact, this car's apparently won more Grand Prix races than any car in the history of motorsport. Ken Tittle did a very good job. So what's the layout? Well, of course, it's different from Sterling's car in the sense that the engine and the gearbox are behind the driver. The seat is a much more reclined seat, almost lying down, in fact, when you consider the driver's position versus the Maserati. 
aerodynamics are clearly different. You've got this enormous wing in the back, which of course is pushing the car down onto the road. The front end aerodynamically, again, is uh, very useful for its time, you must remember, because this is not just yesterday. Uh, the tires are, are clearly much larger, and of course a lot more rubber on the road. So that well, gives us a lot of grip as well. How fast would the thing go? Well, it was about 180, just maybe a fraction more than 180 miles an hour on the straights. But the big difference must have been through the corners with all this adhesion. Well, it, it really was at that time the leading edge of technology for aerodynamics way back then, and it really pressed it down. How about that corner that uh, Sterling took at Silverstone, Stowe? How, how fast would this one go through it? About about 130, I would have think, maybe a push at 135. It was a fourth gear corner on a five-speed gearbox. And how, exactly how dangerous was racing at the time these cars were in? Well, that was a very negative thing. Motor racing safety in those days simply didn't exist. And in fact, in one year, in 1968, a driver died every single month for four consecutive months on the same day. But we had a horrific record at that time on safety. Well, you were the man who actually changed uh, Formula One from a blood sport into what we know today. Would you have been able to push those safety measures through if you hadn't been champion? No, I don't think I would. Sterling, do you regret driving before these safety measures were there? I'm, no, I'm, I'm very pleased I did. I mean, I, to me, half the thrill of racing is the danger. I must be, I, 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 I love Jackie, I think he's a great guy, but we have different ideas on this. And uh, I feel that, that it should be dangerous because otherwise everybody out there would want to get in the car and have a go and i think they we ought to be idiots that they they say well those crazy idiots doing that and uh having said that obviously one has to be for safety because it's the obvious way to go but i think the danger of motor racing was an important integral part of the sport as it was in my time it's now a different thing of course well, jackie is he crazy no i don't think i think he's he's there but and he's there to prove it so therefore he survived yeah. it but but i think really the unnecessary hazards have to be removed because in those days it was not good. The public could have been involved. We had to ensure the future prosperity of the sport. Well, by this, speaking of prosperity, by this time the, uh, the, the advertisements are on the car. Obviously the money was coming in. Mm, money? Very much when he got there. Very much. <laughs> <laughs> Scotsman? <laughs> well, no, let me put it to you. How much did you earn compared with, say, Sterling's big year? The 1971 year, I think. I think I earned about 1.2 million. But in those days, that was an awful lot of money because... Oh, yeah. <laughs> not like now. I mean, not like now. No. I, mean, I mean, to somebody like Clive James, that's nothing uh, today. Uh, <laughs> Sterling, you wouldn't be human if you didn't think that you were, you were too early for the gravy train. Yes, I was for the gravy train, but not for the fun. I'm lucky. I was sufficiently good that I made a, a good living. I mean, I made a living as well as I would have as a solicitor or a, a, whatever. But... I had the fun, and, I, and that's something that I wouldn't, I wouldn't swap. I'm, I'm sorry, obviously, I didn't make the big money, because it'd be a lot easier now. I can coast more easily. Well, Jackie and Sterling, you've got a lot to talk about, so stick around and talk about it later on. Thank you very much, Jackie Stewart. <laughs> mm -hmm. Moving on, until only yesterday, the most bulldog breed, bold and brave of all the British world champions, won his 31 Grand Prix races in cars that look like the ones we know today, perhaps are not short of the full technical refinement, but that's the way he liked things, slightly hairy. For his countless British fans, his absence from the sport is a source of pain, assuaged only by the hope that even now he might come back. He's come back tonight, Nigel Mansell. <laughs> Low temperatures, this is the first time they've run the cars here in the new regulations and uh, this is the problem, the groove tyres, the low temperatures, the hard compounds. Mika Sala was taken up to the medical centre for a check, he complained about a headache, he had tyre marks actually on the back of his helmet, good news is he's now okay to, to go out for qualifying. Villeneuve's reaction to that, quite astonishing. Quite astonishing. So that's the best accident I've ever had in Formula One. He meant that his worst crash. Came in and Moore had to stop. Once Andre got the box, Moore took off as I was carrying my tire out. His left rear hit the tire I was carrying, knocked it out of. We've got to go back upstairs. We've got a car in. Problem. Yeah, we've had a huge accident down at the end of the back stretch. A car has rolled coming out down under braking there, and it's uh, one of the Newman Haas cars. I think it's Christian or is it Michael? It's difficult to tell from this view. It's Michael. It is Michael. Andretti, we have confirmation, not out of 
of the car yet, and obviously a fire in the back there as well. The uh, safety crews running across the gravel, trying to get there as quickly as possible, and in fact very fast to get to the car. It is uh, definitely Michael. You can see that uh, silver crash helmet, the familiar silver crash helmet, and obviously there's been a nasty incident. Mark Blundell is in the gravel too, perhaps involved in that. They were all battling together. PJ Jones is there as well. He was being, uh, well, not that, no, he was actually up there as well. He was in that battle. They were almost three abreast on the previous lap coming into that turn three area. And now it looks as though it's all gone wrong for them again. And surely we're going to see another full course caution. JJ Leto, I can see coming into the pits as well at this point. And Alex Sonardi also came into the pits too. I'm surprised that Gilles de Ferrer did not come into the pits. Uh, he was at the front of the pack and uh, must have realized, uh, or the crew must have realized it was going to go full course caution. Actually, the yellows have only just come out, but it was pretty obvious it was going to be a full course caution. And I'm surprised they didn't call Gilles in to make that pit stop because when he does come in, he will fall to the back of the pack. Oh, there is Michael Andretti. He is uh, certainly communicating with the safety crew and uh, let's hope that he's not badly hurt in this. It looks as though they're getting the crash helmet off. But that car went over and over as uh, we were in that interview with one of the Penske personnel. And there we can see a view of Michael down there in the car. They will take his, their time to get him out. Now let's see what happened. We've got the onboard camera. Let's see if uh, someone appears while well, the accident perhaps happening ahead of him. Oh, he had a chance. Oh, he went trying to get past PJ and they clipped. Wow. Now oh, that was a high speed accident. Look at that. He hadn't really started braking when he hit the back of uh, PJ Jones. And look at the way that car got flicked into a roll across the gravel trap. They've increased the size of that gravel trap this year. And I think for Michael Andretti's sake, it's a very good thing they have. 190 miles an hour they're doing as they come down there. And that's where it all went wrong. And there in a separate incident. Leto trying to get past Zanardi, and there was the contact. And then appeared Michael Andretti across in front of everybody. Wow, and uh, Carpentier was lucky not to get wiped out there. Astonishing accident, really. I'm not quite sure. I, tough to see what was going on there, but uh, look at the severity, the violence of that crash, and the swift chassis there um, really taking a beating. And there's Mark Blundell's car in the foreground. He's just uh, nowhere to go. And there is Mikey Ka Ka climbing out of that car. Well, how about Somewhat that? shaken, but boy, that tells you a heck of a lot about these cars. Cars, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, just look at the speed, the momentum of that accident. For somebody to be able to get out and walk away, that is just incredible. And there is uh, PJ Jones uh, going over to see him. Let's go down to the pits and to see if we can find out a little bit more. Oh, I've never seen Michael take a tumble like that before. He's probably never had, I think. Mario Andretti is down here, obviously, concern etched into his face. Mario. You've been through these wars for so many years. What's it like as a father to see a son go through that, but then fortunately walk away from it? Uh, you know, it's uh, probably the toughest moment, obviously. Uh, you feel so helpless from here, but um, uh, luckily Ed asked him right away if he was all right. He said, uh, well, I think so. So we knew that he was conscious at least. So but it looks like uh, the car did its job. Boy, the emotion in the voice lets you know just how tough it is to be on this side of the wall to watch something like that. But again, Michael walking away under his own power. Quite right, Gary. You could really hear the lump in the throat from Mario there. What a scary accident that was. And uh, no doubt Mario was extremely worried seeing that huge accident indeed. And thankfully, Michael able to step away unhurt. And uh, well, as you say, Jeremy, brilliant uh, sign of just how strong these cars are nowadays. Fantastic uh, performance from the car. Let's just take another look at the replay at uh, full speed, just how fast things go wrong. This was the incident ahead, but look in the background. That was Leto and Zanardi making contact, but look in the background as, Zanardi, as uh, Andretti just appears already the accident happening. Yeah, look how fast it goes down the inside. Of course, no braking at all there, and uh, there goes a car cartwheeling across the road. And uh, comes the rest of that us. We'll be back in a moment, but uh, it's great to see Michael Andretti. Okay. Once again, watch out for Bobby, though. He's got a good run on his teammate, Bob Brian. And Brian goes to the inside. Bobby goes to the outside. He's had a tremendous run out of that last corner. And if there's one rule between these two, it's that they don't take each other off. And Brian Herter lets Bobby go through without too much of a battle. He's got to watch out for Greg Moore now, who is also all over the back of him with JJ Leto there now. Up into fourth place, courtesy of not coming into the pits. But let me tell you that Michael Andretti is in fifth place. He's got a full tank of fuel. His car will be heavy. He's got a good set of tyres on, though. Look at this. Greg Moore trying to go for second. Brian Hurt. Oh, no! Brian, you so nearly took out your team, boss. He braked late to stop Greg coming past him. And he's so 
Oh, he nearly took Bobby off with him. Yeah, he threw the car sideways to not hit Bobby Rahal there, and he was thinking of his teammate. He knew he was going to be... Oh, oh goodness, that's right Alex there. Barron in the uh, Eagle Toyota. What happened there? I have no idea. He must, the yellow flags must have been out. Whether Alex had some sort of mechanical problem coming down there, it's tough to say. But uh, certainly he lands up there. Look at that, right on top of the car. Uh, of wow. Brian Herder, but Herder, he, uh, he was under pressure there from Greg Moore. He tried to brake as late as he could, and clearly he left his braking too late. And at the last minute, he knew he was going to hit uh, his teammate, Bobby Rahal. Hitting anybody is not good news, and particularly his team leader, Bobby Rahal. So he just threw the car sideways. He just clipped Rahal, but luckily not nearly as hard as he would have done if he'd have just slammed into the back of him uh, uh, on, on all four wheels, pointing in a straight way. So uh, a shame for Herder, a mistake by Herder there, for sure. Bad mistake, really. Uh, he was under pressure from Greg Moore. Well, let's take a look. Apparently the driver is okay. We could see him nodding around. We've heard uh, a good report. Now, there's Herter. He so nearly hits the back of Ray Hall. As you yeah. say, chucks it out of the way. But watch behind, Jeremy. What is going on that uh, Alex Barron ended up launching himself down? Can we spot it in the bottom of the picture here? We see a few cars heading down the hill. We see PJ go through. Well, we don't see what started that. He just suddenly launched himself. Those safety workers are lucky as well because, of course, they were attending to Brian Herter. Yeah, and, a, and look at that again on the replay. And, you know, you can see the way Moore and Herter closed off on Bobby Rahal. Bobby was very conservative down there in turn five. I think he took uh, his young teammate there by surprise. And there's Herter looking around him here. And he puts a look at him. You can just see him brace himself there. He sees Barron coming down towards him. And the corner workers... Well, the cart safety team there, they uh, luckily were just, just paying enough attention to their left there to look up and see Alex Brown flying down towards him. Yeah, frightening, frightening accident indeed. Look at this, that's the moment he braced himself. Natural thing to put his hands up, of course, is probably the worst thing he can do, but... Uh, yeah, he didn't, uh, don't, he didn't put him on top of his no, helmet, that no. wouldn't have been smarter. He just put, put him up into his chin, I think, mainly to get his hands away from the steering wheel. There's not, not too many places you can put your hands in that uh, situation. There's not much room there, of course. But there is Alex Barron out of the car, out of the Eagle, the shame. Uh, that Eagle's been running awfully well for the first couple of races. It ran, made its debut just last week at uh, Mid-Ohio, and it had been running pretty well this weekend as well, fitted with that new Toyota RV8D engine. But uh, I don't know what happened there. Maybe he just lost it on the braking there. Cold tires, of course, I mean, just coming out of the, out of the pits, and uh, you're braking there from over 200 miles an hour uh, into that tight second gear left-hander at Turn 5. Now they've got the problem of trying to get the thing off the car of Brian Herzog, of course, is still stuck down underneath that car and it uh, can't be a particularly pleasant experience to have a car sitting on top of you. It's great to hear that he's not hurt, but uh, they've now got to try and get that off without uh, doing any further damage either to him or, well, not really matter about the car. I think they're pretty badly damaged already. They've also got a truck in there that perhaps they can lift it off. I think that's probably a more sensible idea. And, uh, well, we are certainly seeing plenty of incident again here, aren't we? Bobby Rahal is uh, now... Uh, up front. Well, he's been into the pits, actually. Bobby has made his stop now. He's decided to take advantage of this yellow to make it. I don't think Alex can get there no matter what happens. He got by Bottos, but he came too late in the day. Here he comes across the line, his second win of the season. Max Biaggi wins the Bruneau Grand Prix. 25 points in superb style. Alex Crivier gets second position. Alex Barros gets the position. Alex Crivier says the fastest lap, a new lap record with a 2.023 on the oh. last lap. Fourth position goes to, to Abbey. Have we got a photo finish for that? No, I think we got Abby over um, over Juba now there. Well, that was a close one. The rest of the field comes streaming through, and there is... It's the Regis Laconi coming over the line. Ocado Corso, my apologies, is getting fourth, so fifth yeah, position. Yeah, yeah. Uh, going, as all of the Italian flat fans come streaming on to... I I'm standing here with Ken Amoto. Irv. What a fantastic race. Max looked great all weekend long. He had a fall yesterday. You must be very, very happy. Yeah, it's been been a long week. We tested here a couple of weeks ago, and and, and we found we we thought things might go well. We knew we had to do something here because we have to do things before Australia because, and we we hope we could close the gap. And unfortunately, Mick had a problem, but we just got to be thankful for these days. You made the, definitely made the right tire choice on the start-finish line. Yeah, <laughs> it was a little confusing, but it, it worked out. <laughs> Congratulations, Irv. Fantastic stuff, Irv Kanemoto, team boss for Massimiliano Biaggi, who collects how many flags has he got on there? I don't think he can carry any more, but he doesn't care. We don't know where are they finished. We're going to have to take a photo finish. Stuart's decision on that.
Max Biaggi, the winner of the Czech Republic Grand Prix in superb style, just three quarters of a second ahead of Alex Crivier wheeling over. Oh! That was just about... Whoa, man, Randy Mamola. <laughs> I, I, I nearly said well, something Well, I've seen then. you do that before, Randy. I'll just let you guess what it was. He did the mother of all wheelies and just about put it... If he had a rear fender, it would have been on the track. Who, who was this? Max, Max. Biaggi. Oh, he wheeled okay. over the line. <laughs> Doggies. Um, yeah. <laughs> Alex Crivier, by the Flipping way, put out. up the fastest lap on the last lap of the race at 2.02. <laughs> Three on lap one, but Biaggi, well, he nearly fell off at the end of the race. <laughs> Now here comes the mother of all wheelies. Looks okay so far, but what is that? He's not selling enough publicity on the bottom of that ferret. <laughs> Most people don't sell publicity down there because they don't show it. But man, if you could have bought that, that would have been a bargain because that's going to be the repetition that's going to be seen all over the world this week. And if the still photographer's got it, doggies. He'll be making pots of cash out of that one. Goodness me.